Getting a grip. What is the force that makes you stop? What is the force that slows you down? Friction. You need friction. Without friction, you slip and slide Friction You need friction Two things run together and make friction It is the force that slows you down It is the force that makes you stop Stephanie, this thing weighs a ton. Are you sure you're pushing? You are pushing, aren't you, Kenan? I give up. We can't give up. We have to get this across the room. How about calling those movers? Where's the piece of paper with the phone number? Under the box. Oh. It won't budge. No way. Wait a second. I just got an idea. What's stopping us from moving this box is friction. But if we put grease all over the floor, the floor will be smoother, there will be less friction, and it will be easier to move this box. You mean it would be easier to fall on our faces? Let's try it. Can't hurt. Can't hurt? When was the last time you fell on your face? Here. It's got blades, like an ice skate, and a sail, like a sailboat. And it skims along on top of the ice, pushed by the wind. This is an ice boat. <laughs> That's Miguel out there, learning how to sail. He's with Henry Bassett, a world champion ice boater. To go fast, an ice boat has to avoid friction with the surface of the ice. Miguel's going to find out how it does that. That's Carl Jung, an engineer who specializes in sled design. He knows a lot about friction. Now you're gonna have to do the brake. Let me get in here, let me take this. Get ready with the brake. Easy. Okay, start pulling it real hard, real hard. There we go. Real hard. <laughs> there you go. You got it. <laughs> That's super. All right. That was great. That was great, guys. It was wonderful. Starting to like it, huh? Oh, man, how fast are we going? I figure we're going about 30, maybe 35 miles an hour. I felt like we were flying. Well, how fast does an ice pool go? Oh, radar has been used to time at over 100 miles an hour. There's very little friction between the ice boat and ice. When you have two surfaces rubbing against each other, no matter how smooth it is, you have a resistance to movement because of bumps 
on the surfaces. And that resistance of movement is friction. Why don't we uh, take a look? We'll show you why we've got so little friction with this. We use many different kinds of runners in different conditions, but we're always trying to do one thing. What we're trying to do all the time is to actually melt the ice, and we do that with the weight of the runner and the speed of the boat. The speed of the runner sliding across the ice creates friction, which creates heat, which melts the ice, turns it to water, and then we're sliding the runner on water instead of ice, and so that's when we go the fastest. Now, when you said pressure, the pressure is created by the people inside the boat and the weight of the boat itself, right? Right. And you're also talking about the friction that's created by the steel blade rubbing against the ice as it slides along. Yes, because, again, there's pressure between the thin surface of the runner here and the ice to create the water, which we then ride on and, and go very fast on. When two surfaces rub together, they tend to stick. This resistance to movement is called friction. It happens because most surfaces are irregular or bumpy. If you look through a microscope, you'd see that even very smooth-looking surfaces, like ice, are actually pretty bumpy. And these bumps catch on each other. When an ice boat moves, friction between the blade and the ice causes heat. This heat and the pressure of the weight of the boat melts some of the ice under the blade. And this makes a thin layer of water between the blade and the ice. So the boat is actually sliding along on a film of water. Pretty obvious. First, there was too much friction. Now there's not enough. Now there's no way to get a grip on the floor. There must be some way to increase the friction. How about special shoes? Maybe these will give me some more traction. Maybe these will work. Now I know why they're called slippers. Now what? I think I see something that will work. Oh, yeah, sneakers. These should do the trick. This bumpy surface should give us more friction. Thank you, friction. Deborah and David are headed for the reptile house at the Bronx Zoo in New York. Let's see if we can try and get him to go forward here. Okay, here Can we you go. Get... Here he goes. He is really making an S. That's Kathy Garrity, the reptile keeper. Lots of S's. Well, you can see the mound, the S that he made over here. Right, you see he's building up the sand here, and he's using his muscles and his scales to push back against this using friction to push himself forward. So in order to go in that direction, he push in the opposite direction. Right. Oh. Do all uh, different kinds of snake move in the same way, using friction? Yes, all snakes, there's four different kinds of movement, and all snakes can use them. Um, bigger, heavy-bodied snakes tend to use a different kind, which I can show you later. Yeah. But the smaller snakes, when they're trying to get away from something or just basically moving, will do this serpentine motion. He's using many parts of his body at the same time. He's using the scales on the bottom, and he's also using muscles that are attached to the ribs and then to the skin. And all of these are working together in order to push back to make the animal move forward. So, Kathy, how many different kind of scales do snakes have? 
Well, they usually have two different kinds. On the top, you can see that they're all uniform in shape. They're all the same size, and they're small scales. Yeah. Small little diamond shape. Right. This, the top of the skin is used for protection. But if you turn them upside down, you can see that the scales are shaped differently. Yeah, yeah. They're long rectangles. Right. They're the entire width of the snake. They run from one side to the other, and that's only one scale. Run your hand along in the direction of, from head to tail, you'll feel how smooth it is. Yeah, it's smooth. But if you run your finger in the other direction, you can feel that there's some resistance there. These scales lift up. This is where they're using the friction against yeah. the earth and the, you know, whatever they're crawling on mm -hmm. and pushing back with these scales to move forward. This is a black-headed python. Python? Right. That sounds scary. Is it poisonous? Oh, no, not too... S no, it's not poisonous. And does it move the same way? He can move the same way. But because he's a thicker-bodied snake, he has a lot more weight to him. Yeah. He is... Uh, he is heavy. Yes. He is more likely to use a different kind of movement. He'll use his weight to help him move, as opposed to using rocks and sticks to help him move. So the other snake probably couldn't move on glass like this because it would have nothing to push against. Right. Does he have two different kinds of scales, like yes. the other one? Right. If you look on the bottom, he has the same kind of scale formation as the other one. Yeah. The one big scale that goes all the way across the bottom. It feels really nice. It's not slimy at all. But he uses them differently. Right. He can move in what is called as the caterpillar motion. There he goes. Can you see the side, the skin moving? Yeah, the, the scales are lifting up on the bottom. Right. What he's doing is he's using the muscles that are attached to the ribs and the bottom scales. Mm -hmm. They pull the bottom scales up, they bunch them together, yeah. and then the weight is pressed down and the snake is moved forward. Like this, or? Right. And it, it does that in succession. As it starts in the front, it will move itself up and move itself up itself up. So it looks like it's actually walking on its ribs, oh. but it's not. All snakes can use all kinds yeah. of locomotion, but because these are a bigger snake, they can use their weight to help them move forward. They can get the friction from the bottom scales and their weight pressing down on the earth. Snakes have four different ways of moving around. There's basic serpentine motion, concertina motion, excellent for tree climbing, sidewinder motion for moving on sand, and caterpillar motion, good for moving in a straight line. No matter which kind of motion it uses, a snake needs friction to move. Friction is a force that makes a big difference in how things move. If there's too much friction, things won't budge. Reducing friction makes things move more easily and faster. But too little friction can make for a slippery situation. Without friction, snakes couldn't get anywhere, and neither could anything else. Friction. Can't move with it, can't move without it. 3 to 1 Classroom Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.